Let's discuss the quit command. The quit command is used to terminate a single line 4, to return from a subroutine, or to exit from a block that was invoked by an argumentless do. Uh, the quit command, for example, in a for command um, in a for loop can be seen here. Here we have a um, form of the for loop which has no upper limit. It's for i equals 1 by 1 forever. Uh, so there must be some way to get out of here, and the way to get out of here is with the quit. So as the i increments, each iteration it will increment, the quit has a post conditional. And the post conditional tests whether i has become greater than 100. When the i is greater than 100, the quit will execute. Executing the quit terminates the for, and we'll move on to the next line. Otherwise, notice the two blanks after the quit. Um, otherwise, we'll write out i and i times i, just something at the end of the line. So in this case here, it, it terminates a single line 4 loop. Uh, in another example, where we use it with a, um, with, a, with a block invoked by an argument, let's do, we have a couple of things here that are new on this first line. First of all, we said f is equal to 0. Um, and first of all, we have the 4. You notice it's got two blanks after it, no argument. If a 4 has no arguments, it means do forever, or while, essentially, while forever. Uh, so this for loop will has no upper limit, it has no index variable, it just iterates continuously until something causes it to stop. Then we have the do command, also with um, no arguments after it. The do invokes the following block. See these three lines here? These lines are invoked by the do. We'll read a line in. We will t check dollar sign test. You remember I said earlier that after a read command, dollar sign test <coughs> indicates if the read was successful. If dollar sign test is true, it means we did read something. Dollar sign test is false, it means we didn't. So the ifs here, you notice we get the not sign in front of it. If not dollar sign test, then we set f equal to 1 and we quit. Well, this quit exits, exits from the block. From this block here, it, it takes us back up to where we were um, when we invo invoked the block, which is the do. And then from the do, we execute the next thing on that line. The next thing on the line is a quit post conditionalized by the expression f is equal to 1. Well, f stays at 0 until we try to read and it fails, and f is made, to, uh, is made equal to 1. When that fails, this quit will execute. This quit, when it executes, terminates the for. Are you with me there? So initially, we do forever. We I shouldn't say do forever because it's for forever. The do is really separate here. Um, we iterate forever, invoking the block each time at each iteration. The block attempts to read a line. If the line is successful, we'll just write the line back out on the next line here. However, if dollar sign test comes back as false, not false of course is true, we set f equal to 1, um, we terminate the block we're in, we go back up. If we go through and we, ex we execute the write, we terminate the block and we go back up to the do, but in this case of course the f is still 0, so the quit doesn't execute. So we get two forms of the quit here. We got the quit that exits, exits from the block, and we got the quit that exits from the for. All right. Um, using a quit was also used to return from legacy subroutines or blocks. You would invoke a, um, a block of code. The code would execute. If the code hit the end of file, it would return automatically. But if you wanted to return prior to hitting the end of file, you would put a quit, and that would return back to the invoking do. And what these do's looked like when they invoked blocks of code like this, and they're still, they're still used, obviously, um, you'd have the do followed by a label. That would be in the current program. And what would happen here is, wherever the do was, you would go to that location in your current program, you would execute the code there until you either hit the end of file for the program, or you encountered a quit at which time you would return to this do and move on to the next argument or the next uh, uh, command. This form here, lab plus 3, um, is similar to the one up above, but you would go to the label and then advance three lines. 
this has some real programming issues involved. Um, it assumes that programs never change, and three lines from the label is always the same thing, which is probably not a good idea. But anyway, um, label plus th three lines, that's where the execution would start. Again, it would continue until it either ran out of program or it encountered a quit. In either case, it returns to the invoking do, and you move on to the next thing. Uh, another way of doing it is where you give a file name. And the file name is expressed usually with a circumflex up arrow indicating it's some kind of file activity, um, and the name of the file. What this would do is it loads the file into memory, executes the file until it either runs out of code and hits the end of file, or you hit, you hit a quit, in which case the program returns to the invoking do. So that's, that's actually bringing a program in, executing the program, and then returning to the original program. Notice none of these have parameters, by the way. Uh, they're just, and, and when you called a program or went to a block of code, all the symbol table was the same. Any changes made in the symbol table in the block of code were changes when you returned as well. Um, the other form here is when you have a file and a label. This would say, go to and bring in file.mumps and begin executing at lab one in, in that file. So that's an entry point. Similarly, you could have an offset. Start at label one plus three lines. Again, probably not a good programming activity, but that's how it worked. In each case, um, uh, the, the, the code invoked would terminate if it sees a quit. Here are some examples using the quit. In this example up at the top here, we would, this would be in, the, in, in a program someplace where it says do top. Somewhere further down in the program is top. Top would be, for example, it would probably um, be printing a page title on, on a report of some kind. So at the invoking point, it says do top. It scans down, finds the label top, and begins executing the code beginning at top. Um, until it encounters the quit, in which it returns back to the do, and whatever is following the do. Uh, this is a non-standard use of break, which is somewhat similar to a quit. Uh, it's, in, it's the one that you, I, you can use in my version of mumps. Um, forever do, um, read a, again, this is the same as you saw before. If test is false, uh, then instead of executing a quit and then going back up here and executing another quit and having the control mechanism, I just use break. Break takes you out of the current, um, out, of, out of the current loop um, and moves you on. It doesn't go through the extra steps. It's a bit. It's not in the standard though, but it is a bit quicker. And again, break break takes no arguments, so technically you have to have two blanks after it. Um, here's an example again, which we I think we saw earlier. This is a for loop. Um, it has no upper limit, so it's forever, um, and it is scanning through. It is scanning through an array A, asking whether or not array sub one, two, three, four, and so forth exists. Dollar sign data returns true uh, if it does exist. It returns non-zero. There's a couple of things dollar sign data can return, but they will all be non-zero um, if if the element exists. Um, so if it is zero, not zero, of course, is true and the quit will execute. In other words, it'll keep going and writing out the elements of the vector a until it can't find any more, until it hits a value of i for which there is no element. And the quit applies to the four. Um, here is an example of a doubly nested loop. Um, we have an outer loop here involving i and an inner loop involving j, all in the same line. Uh, the inner loop will execute um, 10 times for each iteration of the outer loop. So when i equal, equals 1, we'll go in here and we'll iterate j from 1 to 10. And um, we're asking if uh, b sub i comma j is equal to 99. If it is, um, we set x equal to 1 and we quit. Now this quit applies to this inner 4. It applies to the inner 4. And also note the quit will only execute if the expression in the if statement is true because it's, a, it's the um, subject of the if statement. Because from, from this point forward, from the if statement forward, those, will only, those lines will only be executed, those statements will only be executed if the expression in the, in the if statement is true. Um, <clears throat> here we've got um, an example um, similar to what we, what we did before. Uh, we are looping through... Uh, from 1 to 10, the do invokes uh, the, the, the single line block, 
Uh, the block tests if a sub, 90, a sub i is equal to 99. If it is, it turns on f to be 1. We get back up here. We return to the do. We then uh, try to execute the quit. Uh, the quit will execute if f becomes 1. Otherwise, it'll keep cycling. So when we when we exit here, we'll either be I will either be um, 11, indicating we uh, we exceeded 10, uh, or um, it'll be some value between 1 and 10, indicating that uh, we found uh, an element of the vector a that was equal to 99. Uh, in this case here, we're using it uh, somewhat similarly. Um, forever, or no, for i equals 1 by 1 to 100, we do or invoke the block. So this, this, this loop will terminate anyway at 100, um, or when i exceeds 100. Um, we set a sub i equal to 1, we set b sub i equal to uh, i times 2, and we ask the question is if, a, if i is greater than 50. If it is, we terminate the block and we go back up and it increment uh, the, the, the value of i. So for the first, for, for 1 through 51, we will execute, well, for, for, from 1 through um, 50, I should say, from 1 through 50, we execute the entire block. When i exceeds 50, we're really only going to execute the first, well, we'll execute three lines, of course, but these are the effective lines that will be executed because we'll always terminate and return back up to the, uh, up to the invoking uh, do statement. So this last line won't, in other words, won't be executed once i is greater than 50. Uh, there is also the question of using a quit to return a value. We'll talk about some functions and subroutines a little later, but here's an example of a function. These are these are, were added to the standard somewhat later. The function down here is a block of code. It's part of the same routine. Um, it is, it has a label. The name of the function, it's a label, it's also the name of the function, and it receives a parameter. The parameter will be called x inside the, inside the function. Uh, what it does is it just uh, takes x, multiplies it by itself, and then hits the quit. The quit acts like a return in that it returns back the value of x, which is the square of what it received as the input. And when that comes back, notice the double dollar sign. You see, I, if I invoke AAA, pass it the value 2, I would return the value 4, and 4 would be assigned to, will be assigned to i. Notice the double dollar signs are required um, when you're doing a function. But this is an example of where, it's only in functions, um, where the quit can return a value. And it must be a function that receives a parameter. Uh, it must be invoked like this, but it can return values. In ad additional is the break command, which is not really well defined in most versions of mumps. It was intended to pause the program so that you could look at different variables, possibly alter them. It was used for debugging. Uh, in my version of mumps, just parenthetically here, as I mentioned before, it breaks, um, it, it breaks you out of a block. So in this thing here, this particular example, uh, we're doing forever, we're executing the block, we're reading something in. If the, um, if, if the read fails, we break. Break takes us out of the for, out of the do, and takes us to whatever follows the block, rather than all that signaling with semaphores and so forth.